What's going on, y'all? It's Liddy Fontaine, aka Yadon Israel, aka Pretty Liddy's what they call me. I, you know, I, I dabbed my bad bottle up. This is another episode of Lit, the premier platform for all things literary, swag, and everything in between. Today's guest, we have the beautiful Tanya. That's right. And ah, okay, boom, Islam. Tani Nandini Islam. <laughs> Tani Nandini Islam. Said it right? <laughs> you said it perfect. Okay, boom. <laughs> She's going to be here chopping it up about her f- debut novel that came out two years ago. It's five days past the anniversary of the two years, Bright Lines. Um, she's going to be talking about High Flower. Mm-hmm. Her High Wild Flower is High Wild Flower. human beauty line. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she's going to walk us through this swag fit she got on right now. <laughs> so we need you to stand up. We got this swag cam that we, that we brought out specifically for this occasion. All right. So walk us right. through the fit. Walk us through. So I got my Adidas slides because I only... Rock Adidas Adilette right. slides. Okay. Um, and then this whole ensemble is H&M and the Great Eros, which is from Williamsburg. Hey. Um, it's a bodysuit. I'm really into bodysuits right now because okay. I have to go, you know, lifting heavy boxes for my business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I need something that can maintain. Um, right. Then I have my jewelry. This is from Vera Meat. It's like okay. a spine of a fish. Okay. And then cool. I have my Ankh. All right. I don't know if you're flipping me off or you're trying I'm to not, show off I'm the not. life. Okay. Um, and then I have my tiger from Dusty Rose Vintage. This Damn, is my Bengal geez. tiger. All right. I got an opal. Okay. From Etsy. Was that a birthstone? It's my birthstone, October. Okay. Yeah. It's my birthstone. And then the earrings. And the earrings are Givenchy. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Vintage. <laughs> All right. And yeah, that's just, pretty just much it. What's this book bag? What's, what's, what's this book bag? Oh, it's uh, from the Barney's Warehouse sale that oh, was she, in Williamsburg. She, she, she is killing the game. <laughs> Barney's Givenchy. I, she, I never even know it's pronounced like that. I'm that's, very in the high low, yeah. you know. So All I have right. my, my $19 Amazon.com slides, but I also have like You got to mix it. You got to mix it all the time. Um, yeah. So thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for uh, having me. I know you want to get these Marduces cracking. Soon as possible. <laughs> so let's not waste any time. So what you're gonna do? You see your name is on there. You're gonna pop the bottle. Okay. Open and pop on the bottom. Yeah, you're gonna no, not not pop. for this one. No, for the yeah, actual for, for, for okay. the yeah for the douce. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna drink past the leaves. Okay. And then so you now you can. Now I can do. Yeah. That. Boom. Uh oh, my hands. You know, yeah. I got yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Boom. Boom. You're gonna do another one on the. All right, now you're gonna tap the bottom of this bottle. That's the that's the hood custom. Then go on, crack this. I grew up in a Muslim household, so I don't have alcohol customs. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's why we Islam, have to, you know. <laughs> no drinking. There's a there's a lot of those uh like the corner stores in my hood. Um, that's not too much, right? No, it's perfect. All right, Thank cool. You. Um, I didn't realize like I used to wonder like why are none of these. These stores, like the Yemeni stores, they don't sell no liquor. Then I was like, oh, they, don't like, they really, they really commit. They like, they're not even doing it for capitalism. Like, nah, we got morals. Like, we have uh, juice. <laughs> All right, so you swirl it around. Okay. Boom, get that going. Then top. All right. Thank you for coming on. Lit. Thank you for having me. Oh yes, let's get lit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, boom. Boom. Talk to us, talk to me about where you grew up, how you grew up. Give us, give me, give me the world building. Uh, Fiction 101. Fiction 101. All right. So I was born in Carbondale, Illinois in the Midwest. Okay. Nothing to do with New York. Look at how surprised you got. Uh, Yeah. My father was a student of chemistry and my mom was a young, you know, bride that he brought over from Bangladesh in the 70s. Yeah. And I was born in 82. And we basically, my whole childhood, we moved around from the South and the Midwest every few years. So I lived in Alabama, Texas, Missouri. Seeing a lot of this country, um, I went to Robert E. Lee Elementary School. So a lot of conversations that are happening right now, like, were things that we talked about in my family at a very young age. Because I was dealing with a lot of Islamophobia and just assumptions of my abilities, of my intelligence. Now, back then, were you wearing the, like, the full garb no my family is not religious in that sense just okay yeah yeah, yeah. like internalized internal they're very religious they, yeah they pray but we're bengali so our culture is this melange of 
Hindu culture and Muslim culture. So my dad's a singer and we learn dancing and singing. Yeah. It's very like sensual and open. But religiously, they're very religious. And their names are obviously Muslim names. So I think for us, the confusion of that was one thing. Your last name is the religion. It is the religion. <laughs> <laughs> so, no you know, <laughs> exactly. You're that. It's like, yeah, no, nah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm Baptist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Call me Jewish. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that was the thing that I had to negotiate. But um, I have this very distinct period of living in St. Louis where it was during the Gulf War and a lot of that kind of negotiating what your faith is in relationship to these very racist, violent people mm -hmm. that are around us and yeah. conversations with my parents being like, you have to be careful. You have to, you know, if you need to pass and not t tell people your religion up front or not yeah. tell them your name, like these conversations that people have with their families when they're not part of the dominant culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was something that I definitely dealt with. Um, and being kind of an outsider and a little bit of this like weirdo and very much a nerd, I was in books. Like books was my haven. Like right. I was that South Asian kid in the spelling bee. Oh, <laughs> like, you were. Were you spelling bees? You. I was in the spelling. Like, I, I made spelling, it like, very far, but then I didn't win. Shit. Words yeah. that weren't words. Like, yeah. <laughs> like don't they give y'all a different dictionary for spelling bees? Yes. Like, and I used to hide it inside of the Archie comics because I was like, it was a small little book. Yeah, high low shit was. Old. He was always doing high low. From I was the like, beginning. Betty is so much worse than Veronica. I was just really in my trying. I mean, my dad would be like, Oh, you're, you're studying. Okay, and I'm like, There's an Archie comic in this, but so I wasn't really doing that for myself. Obviously, it's my parents' literacy, but I, I do remember, you know, now that I think back on it. Anytime I read a book, my dad was like, write a synopsis, put it in this index card box. Like, I was very, I was like a little librarian of my life. Yeah, I mean, he was, <laughs> he was trying to instill yeah, curiosity in yeah. me. So that all happened for, you know, just all of my childhood. Avid reader and living in these places where I was always an outsider, always a minority. And like, it was a very black and white consciousness. So people would be like, are you black? Are you white? And I'd be like, I'm brown. I'm tan. At age five, you know, not yeah. knowing how to articulate, I'm Bangladeshi. Um, but I had a very, this is an, a memory that I, I really kind of has stayed with me my whole life, but I had a teacher who was pretty much undermining my intelligence. She always thought I was kind of dumb because I was very quiet mm. and, you know, slight accent, like the whole thing of just, I'm not fitting in. And she would call me Tony. She just was like, I don't know how to say your name, so I'm going to call you Tony. She was this was white that? woman. Okay. And... She that, always, that accent, I, like who's that? That accent was very Missouri. She was this is Missouri. She's like, <laughs> Missouri. Tony, <laughs> and I was like, I'm not Tony. I'm Tony. Like you know, for her, yeah. Tony and Tony sound the same. So she's like, you're Tony, and she would always eat those like orange crackers with peanut butter in them, I and like leave the crumbs on. And it was just like this being that I was like, you're so foreign to me, but you're also invisibilizing me every day, and it was right. affecting me. And I was like a depressed little five year old. Yeah. And one day my dad realized what was going on, and he was like, got a report back from me being like, she doesn't seem to have reading comprehension. And my dad flipped. He's like, you've been reading since you were three years old. These like white people are being insane. Well, all right, Dad. I'm glad. I'm glad, Dad. And he went into the school. He like got in their face. He was like, don't ever say my daughter can't read. Because that yeah. is all she can do. And she could read better than all these people. <laughs> right, right, like right. He did the opposite, which is like to really be like, look, like that is how we're going to get any of us ahead is if she knows how to read and right. be smart and all this stuff. But sometimes what happens, especially, um, I know your book handles like immigrant experience. Mm -hmm. um, so often what happens is when not even just immigrants, but people are trying to become a part of the dominant culture. Absolutely. There is a lot of that inter internalized denial. And that shame. Yeah. And yeah. you talked about like even Mira, like when you had the, the conversation at Greenlight yep. um, two yep. years back, you was talking to Mira and Mira was talking about how, how her aunt had like sort of was like, can't we write about why you write about Indian people write about something real and it was like bro like, <laughs> oh god it's so we, internalized are we fake like like the what hate, you would, the hate yeah. the inner hate so it's, yeah. that's why I, I said are we white I and said, it's like yeah. we're not ever gonna be white guys yeah. so let's let that one go no yeah go. so like it's just dope that your pops was able oh, to no. like I mean they saw age, people be, die around them for the war that they survived which is also in, in this and what novel war? so give, give yeah like give 
Yeah. So any Bangladeshi person, I think, of my generation, and obviously my parents' generation, the war of liber- for liberation, um, okay. which is a war between Bangladesh and Pakistan okay. uh, in 1971, that shaped the country. It made the country because it was part made, of Pakistan before. It made, oh, it made bang- Bangladesh, Bangladesh actually Bangladesh, okay. which means land of Bangla. So they're very nationalistic in that sense and very yeah. proud to be I've been Bengali. saying it wrong all these years now. I know how to say it right. Bangladesh. We've been saying Bangladesh. Like, I like, like how Bang- that sounds too. I don't know. I'm, I'm cool with pronunciations being different. I don't know. You're American. You say it in America. Yeah, right? but I want to say it the right way. Bangladesh. Yeah, okay. Uh, Bangladesh. I want. But uh, I, I don't know. I, he came into my school and he brought all these like different tchotchkes and pictures and photos from Bangladesh and did a presentation in my class mm-hmm. about Bangladesh. And it's like, we're boat people. These are like different boats that we swim in. And this is a flute. That's a traditional flute. Like just a very much like a cultural immersion with all my friends in the class who are like other five-year-olds who had never even heard of Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. And he did like a workshop about Bangladesh because that's what the school negotiated with him. Yeah. To be like, well, why don't you come in and like do something? And it put it on my dad to teach us, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, he really shined and blossomed in that moment to make me feel proud of being from this place and everyone was like that was really cool that your dad did that yeah, <laughs> like yeah, my yeah. teacher like were you were you kind of mortified by that as a, as a kid i think at five you're still really in love with your parents like you're still like they're really cool i don't know if i was mortified by my dad i think at that time i didn't want to but you I grew mean, up in new york this is in missouri it's a very different context i feel like okay you don't think I, I don't know. I think that. No, I mean, I think like, maybe in New York there's this thing of like. Like you're aware of coolness. Like earlier. your coolness is like yeah, like how independent. And maybe this is like a black cultural thing, so, especially with boys. Like you don't want people to know you really have parents. Yeah. You kind of no, want to be seen that. as like the kid who just is like, yeah, I do whatever I want. So like when people see your mother and your father or like what you're a part of, it posit you in a, in a place of limitation like we know there's somebody above you whereas like when no one sees still that true i think it's just because he was like uh, doing a presentation with little artifacts and mm-hmm. people were like fascinated by just something they didn't know anything about i mm-hmm. don't know they were like very um but they just have no idea where this place was on the map so i yeah, think yeah, that yeah. was kind of what i felt like seen in a way that I had never been seen because I was the only non-black or white student in my class. Yeah, and that's also often a thing that yeah. I'm even learning. Like, damn, like, I grew up in Bed-Stuy, but, you know, there were, you know, Puerto Rican, Dominican, mm-hmm. Panamanian people. There was, like, you know, it was never really, like, a lot of people from, like, the closest, the most we've had of a, like, the most I've had in my life of a, like, sort of in-between that wasn't, like, like, Hispanic, sort of thing who we call Spanish our whole lives was like the coolie kids right like the kids who were like from the West Indies mm-hmm. but they were like Trini or yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah yeah but they were like the coolie trinities mm-hmm. and so it was like we I just was like they all black like if you ain't mm-hmm. white that's how we so totally how did you navigate, navigate yeah how did you navigate that I think I had a similar experience I think that you know when you're <laughs> so when I moved to we moved to New York when I was you know 10 and I became aware of cool culture and clothes and my how I looked. I yeah. was very dorky in my Midwestern vibes. No offense to the Midwest, but I definitely was like, Mom, I need a whole new wardrobe. Yeah, like, yeah, this yeah. Is not happening. Wearing like one piece moves and whatnot. Just like, <laughs> like yeah, huge this is a white Friday night. This plastic is what, glasses. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but I, this one kid asked me one time, do you watch Blossom or do you watch Martin? Like he was like trying to figure out where, and I was like, I watch Blossom both because <laughs> i do i love blossom and i love martin and like you love martin i love you, martin you love yeah martin. totally oh okay totally wait hold on time out this, this episode might be longer than it needs to be <laughs> your favorite episode of martin oh my god now i'm like it just i feel like whenever him and gina or whatever her name was got yeah. together wasn't that one of the Oh, the first when they yeah, first met. When they and first he met. was playing the saxophone yes. and she was like glad across the floor. Yes. yes. That episode. I mean, okay. I just like remember being we're, like we're I gonna be both. like we're gonna be like <laughs> super close friends now. Like Well, you know. We've 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 had like periphery <laughs> interactions, but I think you're gonna be like a main you're gonna be like a I am very honored by that. Yeah, nah, like <laughs> Do you Martin. listen to Hot 97 or Z100? <laughs> I'd be like, oh, uh, both. I actually listen you to Z100 too. You know, like, I, I like Four Non Blondes and I like Snoop Dogg. Like, I can't yeah. pick. So I was always doing both, which I think is a very common Asian 
reality, but I did never felt like I wanted to be a white person. I never wanted to be like rejecting people of color. Mm -hmm. um, that was never my thing. I was like the editor in chief of our literary magazine, and all the freaks and geeks would be in that space. And this is at your high school now. And high school now in, in high New school York. You're going to. Uh, I went to Ramapo High School, which was actually the subject of This American Life with the takeover by the Hasidic community around of the board. Okay. So they were like cutting programs with art and music because it's like against their faith. So it's affecting the young people who are most is a mostly people of color in my high school is like Haitian, Indian, Latinos, like Puerto Rican, Dominicans. Yeah. So we had a majority POC high school in a very white suburb yeah. of of New York. So I just was immersed in a uh, place where being an immigrant and being black American and being j white Jewish American, I mean, they were all together in mm. that mix. And it wasn't like everybody got along, but I didn't feel like we had like bullies and cool kids and like that kind of hierarchy. It wasn't yeah. really like that. Yeah. And the people who were bullied, they found a haven often in the literary magazine. And yeah. I was really like, yeah, this is a space yeah. for everybody and no one can get made fun of here. So I was very, but I was, I had a very, um, I think all these experiences from moving and stuff, I had a lot of anger, and I still am a very pretty angry. I think we all are. Person, we are, but people don't tap into there. Like my partner, he doesn't get angry that much, and I'm like, he Your feels is... it. He's Algerian and Irish, so he also was like kind of like what it didn't that? fit what in. Does that look like? It looks pretty white. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you saw him, you'd be like, he's a white dude. Uh, but then you look at him more, and you talk to him more, and his name is Mustafa, and you're like, oh, okay, you're not. A completely mm, white person yeah. you're you can pass though. you can very much pass and, and does I he think and this is not getting into his business um because i oh no does We're he choose open. to does he he chooses to because i feel like passing and identifying is a choice i and think that to an extent i think like, that his family who is irish yeah definitely um sees him as white right but how and, do you, and, and how does see he? how does he see himself is he sees himself as neither white or person of color. He doesn't feel like he fits into either one. Right. And I don't know what that feels like because I'm yeah. like, I'm brown town. Like, this is it, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. So we do have a disconnect on that. But I think, you know, whenever it's like, who are you going to cape for and who are you going to stand yeah. up for? He is a person of color. And okay. that, like, there's this woman who was like, why are they checking our bags? It was at a concert. She's like, we're, it's like they're acting like we're all Muslims or something. Ooh. And we were right behind her. Oh, but we don't look Muslim to her, right? Because yeah. I look Indian. He looks like a white guy. Yeah. And he's like, we are Muslims. And then she was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And like he got really like in her face about that. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, yeah, because that's his father. His father was an immigrant with an accent who was totally alienated in his society. Right. Just as my parents felt alienated mm -hmm. in the society. So I think that alienation was where I really found friends. Mm. who understood me and those friends were mostly people of color Word. you know and the white people that i was friends with they were people whose parents were like we're trying to be multicultural you know it was like that oh, kind those, of the, thing those yeah. parents. the hippie yeah, 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 <laughs> the hippie yeah, yeah, parents yeah, yeah, the colorful what is it called that one that big one piece the what is it called? Kaftan? yes that's like the the the, 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 signature the, the progressive outfit. white multicultural uniform the captain with the birkenstocks <laughs> It's like, uh oh, yeah. <laughs> you got a multi culti in the room. She, yeah, she down he, he, you know, the dude with the, <laughs> with the cargo shorts and the Hawaiian shirts. Hey man, it's easy. It's Apparently, easy. cargo shorts are coming back. <laughs> always, always. So let's go back. Yeah. The first writer mm -hmm. who you talk about alienation and finding your community in, in books, and in, in writing. Who was one of the first writers who had opened that world for you? So I brought this. Arundhati Roy book just because when I read it, Let's I think bring it was that on in the, yeah, so people can see. I mean, it's a beautiful copy as yeah. well. Boom. So there were two, uh, and the other book I would have brought too, but I, yeah. I brought this because I thought we were going to read from it. But, oh, yeah, um, are you? We are, we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it was this book and Song of Solomon. Those were the two oh, books. Tony. Okay. And I actually have a signed copy of Song of Solomon oh, because did. my mom knew the painter of Toni Morrison's house. So she oh, signed wow. it like, regards Toni Morrison. But it's like one of my prized yeah, possessions. It's still Toni. Still Toni. Um, so I read this and the way that she kind of made South Asia come alive. And I remember going to South Asia at 10 years old for the first time and actually hating it because right. being 10 it's very uncomfortable and i was in my body and i was like in this weird like adolescent pre-adolescent oh, puberty just, just, yeah. everything bothered everything you. bothered you um 
but I went back again, you know, later in my, you know, kind of high school and then again in college. And I really thought that the way she played with language and mm -hmm. played with these familial relationships that basically explore all this taboo stuff. I was like, oh my God, she's speaking my language. Right. You know, she's bringing color and life to this world in a way that is immediately intoxicating, but yeah. also talking about really crazy shit like yeah. incest, incest and murder and like, yeah. or not murder, but like someone, you know, a family member dying uh, in a freak accident yeah. and all these things that I'm like, that's the kind of world I want to show. It's not just like, you know, the. Why can't you show us being like perfect and great? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And I, I read, I read one of your essays about that, about that having to navigate those choices of what do you show? What do you and show? How do you show? Absolutely. It? So when I read God of Small Things, I felt like the way that you know she employed language and also storytelling about South Asia plus history and yeah. political history and like the issues of caste that kind of plague India to this day, where yeah. you know. There's complete racism and casteism based on people's skin color and what right. caste they belong to. That was all so fascinating to me. You mm -hmm. know, it's Zadie Smith's White Teeth, same thing. I was like Bangladeshi characters in literature for the first time right. um, that I had ever read. I'd never read Bangladeshi characters. I'd only yeah. read Indian characters. And right. here's this like, you know, black British woman writing Bangladeshi characters mm -hmm. into existence. I was like, this is fucking so incredible. So like I'm yeah, just yeah, not keep going, keep going. Uh, they're like I'm like there's so many books and then Song of Solomon is just like that book. I mean every sentence is a perfect sentence and gem. I mean this, she's just got tapped in by the universe and yeah, it just she, like flowed out of yeah, her. Yeah, she, she's she's on a different level. On a different level. Do you have something from the Roy you can read? Uh like yeah. A little point yeah like just let, I think let, the beginning is yeah a so good read place read read start. that yeah, just yeah, to yeah. let people just because just it's very. And I just saw her at BAM and I was like, wow, you know, do it on your own terms. You know, she just waited 20 years for her next one and it was worth it because she just did other things. She was an activist and to bring the Indian government to its knees in any way is such a powerful, you're such a powerful being. And I think she's just like the fact that she's making work now and it's still so powerful and beautiful to mm -hmm. read. I'm like. Yeah. Who cares if you waited 20 years? Yeah, yeah, That's what yeah, you're waiting yeah, for. Yeah. Alright, so this is chapter one, Paradise Pickles and Preserves. May in Iamenem is, hot, is a hot brooding month. The days are long and humid. The river shrinks and black crows gorge on bright mangoes and still dust green trees. Red bananas ripen. Jackfruits burst. Dissolute blue bottles hum vacuously in the fruity air. Then they stun themselves against clear window panes and die, fatly baffled in the sun. The nights are clear, but suffused with sloth and sullen expectation. But by early June, the southwest monsoon breaks, and there are three months of wind and water with short spells of sharp, glittering sunshine that thrilled children snatch to play with. The countryside turns an immodest green. Boundaries blur as tapioca fences take root and bloom. Brick walls turn moss green. Pepper vines snake up electric poles. Wild creepers burst through laterite banks and spill across the flooded roads. Boats ply in the bazaars, and small fish appear in the puddles that fill the PW deep potholes on the highways. Mm. Um, I just want to say that, like, that world building of seeing where we are in South India, like, yeah. I totally think that that's one of and my how inspirations. How old were you when this came into your life? Um, whenever it was published. Let me see. I'm like, I was, <laughs> I was on it. Yeah, yeah. It just came into my life yesterday. No, I, uh, I feel like it was in the 90s. Where is that? 97. So okay. I was, that was a really crazy year for me too. Because How old I, were you at this time? Uh, I was 15. So I was yeah. about eight because I was seven yeah. years old. And it was like a very, um, I was in a very like intense relationship that was violent in some ways. It was really like a high, one of those high school like, you're my girlfriend. And I oh yeah, yeah, Like yeah, one yeah, of those yeah, crazy yeah. possessive, like, possessive jelly, relationships. Like, ooh, he loves me. <laughs> yeah, and it's <laughs> kind of crazy. Nah, it's like, nah, this is not the wave. Yeah, but uh, I found it, you know, that year and obviously broke up with that guy. But I just completely was like, I'm going in this direction. Yeah. Like, I'm, I, want, I want to create something like this. Right. This is my destiny, like to right. make something that is a reflection of the world that I, mm -hmm. as I see it. So mm -hmm. to me, it was like very much, when I read it, I was just like, oh my God, it's a book about Kerala in 1969, but it could yeah. be 
Kerala today, Kerala anytime, you know? So I really yeah. wanted to keep reading. No, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah, we good. Switch um, gears. <laughs> no, 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 it's not yet. And it's, 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 I want to, cause I want to, I want to be able to, to, to flesh out a lot of things that you do. Cause you, you a multifaceted person like most writers are. And um, I, know, I think one of the amazing. tragedies, like even when we talk about, the, um, how do you say her name? Arundhati Roy. Arundhati mm -hmm. Roy. Okay. It's very, it's very, it's very rare because usually I'm the person getting my name fucked up. So I'm very sensitive <laughs> to fucking up other people's names. Um, but then I'd be like looking at something like I feel like a white guy right now at the Oscars. Like, oh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> like um, Lupita. <laughs> yeah. Lupita, you won, girl. <laughs> Come on, bud. Yeah, let's go. All right. How you, you know, you don't want to fuck it up. So yeah. you, just, you, just, you just throw your shit on, you know, charm on and make it like, oh, it's okay because he's black. So he doesn't. That is offensive. But it's still is. I wouldn't be offended. Um, I'm still American. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's still like, you know, I'm American too. But, you know, people be saying Yondon. And I'd be like. Yondon? You know, it's like, it's not even an in the name. There's not a sense. That's what, what I'm saying. So it's just like That's I said. That's just lazy, crazy. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just sensitive to like yeah. fucking up people's no, names. I appreciate but that. You went to college where? I went to Vassar College. In oh, yeah. UFC. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when did you start taking writing serious? Like, when did writing become like. Like you read this book yeah. and this is what you wanted to do. But when did you start applying yourself to actually craft and like doing that work? Yeah, I think there's three moments for me okay. in college. So the first was um, I wrote a play okay. and it was called Mukti, which means freedom. But it was about a young woman's suicide and her friends kind of okay. um, discovering the reasons behind her committing suicide mixed in with this like... Uh, devotional poet from the 12th century in India. So okay. it was like these two worlds kind of surrealistically colliding. Yeah. And at that moment, I was in a fever writing this in my parents' house, knowing that it would be produced on a black box stage on campus. And Kiese Lehman came to that performance with okay. me because his student was one of one of my directors. He was teaching directors. back then. Yeah. All right. Shout out Kiese yeah, for is, that. Well, then uh, I remember... One, my assistant director was one of his students and they were like his first students, you know, like I hadn't had him in, as a teacher yet. And they were all like, oh, yeah, Kiese is going to come. Like, you know, he's so amazing. Like they were just already feeling him because, you know, the way that he teaches is so passionate and also very much seeing who is in the class and what they need to grow right. as a writer, you know, with. And he saw the performance. He's like, how old are you? And I was like, I'm 21 or whatever, 20 at the time. And he's like, damn, okay. Well, he's like, you should take a class with me at some point. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I signed up for his class and I started writing short stories. I mean, I'm not really a short story writer now, but um, he really saw what I was trying to do as a writer, which mm -hmm. is like, how do I talk about gender identity and sexuality and being a person of color and feeling like you have no home or you don't belong anywhere. Right. Like those are kind of thematically the things that I oh, really yeah, yeah, yeah. always I'm going to write about. And that's, those are yeah, my and obsessions. That's, that's very prevalent across like several things I've written. Like no matter what, it's like you're looking for place Absolutely. and belonging. Absolutely. Yeah. So he really saw that. And I was like, again, I, I'm very angry um, against, I will say white people and white supremacy. I mean, that, those were kind of like very much on my mind and mm -hmm. at that age I mean I was like 20 you know so it's like it's a 85 percent white school like I had 11 black men in my class and many of them dropped out to be in an environment where they weren't the only black men on campus mm -hmm. like same with the women of color it's like I didn't have any dates when I was in school I had like one boyfriend for a semester but like there was no outlet, you know, to really be immersed in the school culture because it's just such, you're a minority. It's very, like, it's an implosive environment. Yeah, and it's like he really just created this space to be like, let's revision and reimagine the world that we live in through right. fiction, through writing. So that was, like, for me, that class, like, writing those stories, seeing one of them published in, like, a... Uh, magazine at the school like those were kind of moments where I was like I'm a writer yeah but my activist and like social justice side was so much more strong like it wasn't like you know I'm gonna go to MFA and I'm gonna become a, you know I, I didn't do any of that wasn't even on my mind like I was like I'm gonna be a community organizer I'm going to collect stories from people and do things that are about making humanity 
right. like a kinder, you know, making the world a better place for humanity. Yeah. And I, you know, so that time, I mean, I was able to go to Kenya for a semester and I lived in Nairobi and I interviewed all these people who had been survivors of torture. And they had been tortured in a building called the Nyayo House, which is like in the middle of Nairobi. It's like if someone was being tortured in the basement of Empire State Building and like no one knew about it. I always worry about that. Not I know, torture of course in, you do. But like with yeah. New York City, is like somebody could kidnap you and take you right next Underground door. Underground somewhere. And like, just yeah. even on the third floor, like who, like who would know? Who like, would know? Yeah. Totally. Absolutely. And I don't know, it was like the journalism thing. I also didn't become a journalist, but I have these instincts to, you know, I would read this paper and then find a name and reach out to that person through the nonprofit they worked at. They would give me another name. It was yeah. like this really, in, so that whole project um, introduced me to a Kenyan actress named Mumbi Kaigua who brought the first vagina monologues to Kenya, which in Kenya is a big deal because female genital mutilation is something that still yeah. happens, you know? So all of these experiences was kind of like writing to change the way we think about things, the way that I took those monologues from people, I turned them into kind of like performance monologues in the Anna Devere right. Smith style. So I was really into playwriting and theater and acting and all that stuff mm -hmm. at that age. So that's my first experience of being a writer is yeah. a writer to perform pieces and a writer in like the college, you know, workshop environment yeah. too. So let me, let me ask you, um, if you could get, bring language to, to your distinction between like, what do you think it, the, even though you don't write short stories, what do you think the function of a short story is to do? Well, I and remember, bow down to short stories. So I'm not, I don't write them only because I think I love multiple threads and things that are open-ended and take a long time to kind of flesh out. And I think a short story is like these very punctuated moments that need to have some sort of resolution and it has to leave you and impart you with this like feeling at the end of it mm -hmm. that is almost like a wistful yearning but also a sense of closure at the same time mm. it's like it hits this certain nerve in you where you're like ah oh, i could read more but no this is the perfect place to stop yeah, and like yeah, yeah. it to hit that note is so hard like i really do bow down to people that can write a wonderful short story right. um but i to me, it's like really about that feeling that comes at the end of it, but also in terms of what is revealed to us about the characters, it's choosing exactly what we need to know as a reader because you can't give us, you know, all the backstory yeah, the way that. that you can do that. I mean, that would bog down the story and make it horrible. Yeah. So it's very much about being present in the moment and knowing what parts of the backstory to bring in of the character. And I think that that is a skill that really requires a lot of restraint Mm. And a lot of like, you know, just knowing what not to say. And I think that's a gift that I'm still learning how yeah, to yeah, cultivate yeah, as a yeah, human. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I'm like the the economy of the economy, the, the of, economy of language. Yeah. Um So you went to the Brook you went to Brooklyn College. Mm -hmm. for, the MFA the, the two thousand seven, yeah. Uh, how did you find out about your MFA program? So I was living in India at the time doing a fellowship. And I was working at a nonprofit there, and I just, I was deeply depressed. And it, New Delhi is a really hard place to live as a woman alone. And, you know, I just. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What you no, the fellowship. What was the fellowship? The William J. Clinton Fellowship for Service oh, to Bill India. Clinton. So Bill, Bill Clinton. <laughs> <Yes>. Okay. Billy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess he started this foundation to do America India work, because America mm. and India are like this um, for many reasons. But I got into this fellowship, it was like 20 people, mm -hmm. and I was there in, in New Delhi living with two women, and we were like three single women living in an apartment, and it was great, but also very emotionally taxing for me because you're always negotiating your, like, your safety. I mean, all the time. Like, yeah. whether it's like you're in an auto rickshaw on a flyover alone, no, hoping that you get to where you're gonna go. Language, I mean, I do know Hindi, but it's not like my first language, right. so it's like uh, really hard to kind of navigate in that way. And also just like people living on top of people living on top of people, it's just like a different world. Mm -hmm. And I started to feel myself really like escape into writing, and I was like, oh, I'm writing again. That mean, must mean like I'm, there's ideas in here that I need. And I've always been that person. Like I said, I'm like, I know I'm writing a book, it's just a matter of when. Right. Um, so I 
was in this, it was during Ramadan, and I'm not a religious Muslim at all, but I went to Kashmir, which is a very, very, like, um, there's just a lot of violence there, but there, it's a very contested area of India. So I, we were there during Ramadan, my friends and I, and you can't really go out, you know, like, it's not allowed to go out. There's a curfew at, like, 11 p.m. Oh, shit. Yeah, and if you're a woman walking around alone, you're definitely going to be like, you're in trouble. So we were stuck in this hotel, and I just started writing, and I was writing and writing. and writing. It was like all-nighter, and then it was like 6 a.m., and then I had this like chapter of a woman on a plane like escaping a bad marriage going you know, to South Asia or something. Yeah. And I was like, this seems like it's pretty good. Like maybe I should try to like apply to like a what's MFA this, program. What's this voice? What's this voice? It's like my stoner voice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was like, oh. <laughs> so, nah, I mean, I think this is. Funny. I mean, clearly like, a stoner book that, came that, out of. <laughs> yeah, that voice. The voice is just funny. Stoner voice, yeah. So, um, <laughs> anytime I do that voice, you know. I'm nah, all right, cool. I just wanted to get the reference point. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I was like, let me apply, and I applied to Brooklyn College. I, I knew I wanted to be in New York. I applied to Columbia, Brooklyn College, New School, NYU. Um, and I couldn't afford any of the other ones, so I got into Brooklyn College, but I also got this email from Michael Cunningham being like, we would love for you to be in the program. And I, that's He's my man stoner. voice. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> man voice and stoner voice are very alike. In my, like inter- interchangeable. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, it's motherfucking Michael Cunningham. <laughs> like, yeah. I love him. And, you know, I read the hours in college or something. So I was just like, that's crazy. And then I, this is not in the time of the internet and submittable and slide room. I was faxing shit to my parents. I was like, can you create pa- a packet of my stuff for Brooklyn College for me and send yeah. it to him? My dad was so on the phone. This is like 07, you said? 07, okay. yeah. I mean, maybe there was more internet, but... This was but... right before, probably. Like, this was like MySpace was still, like, the shit. Yeah, like, I, I wasn't even on Facebook yet. And people were on Facebook. I was just yeah. like, I can't do all that. That's that's crazy. That's your man voice. Yeah, that's my stoner <laughs> voice. That's your stoner... Okay, god damn it. All right. You're getting on top of these I... voices. <laughs> I'm a man in a stoner's body. I don't know. So I basically had my dad, you know, kind of assemble like the last thing for the MFA. And then he talked to Michael on the phone for like an hour. He was like, he's a delightful man. You should totally go to this program. And then it was done. I was like, I agreed to do it. And I was like, yeah, this is, I got in. It's in Brooklyn. I could bike there. I was very like practical and I was thinking about it. And I was like, this is my home. And I want to, I want to be in a place that's close to where I live, you know? Right. So I was living on, like, St. James and Lafayette at the time. Hey, the hood. The biggest hood, the biggest neighborhood. That's yeah. Clinton, Clinton Hill. Best yeah, guy. that's... my yeah, best yeah, yeah. guy area. Um, so, the book. Mm-hmm. The, you say the first chapter started the book. Mm-hmm. Um, what to you... How would you describe the way you write? How would you bring language to what, like... <laughs> it's like- like, how do I know when I'm reading a sentence of yours, like, or, or your work? Like, besides the abstract ways of place and belonging, what do you think? I think sensuality is really important to me in every way, but I'm a very sensual writer. Like, there's this, like, minimalism in American writing that really, I guess, I resist. And for me, I love talking about place and setting the scene and getting a sense of you know people are like don't write what the color of their eyes are i'm like let me let me show you and paint the world for you Mm. like i'm a painter in terms of how i like to lay out a scene or part of the story so i really want to vividly imagine it for the reader in many ways Um, and i'm trying to do less of that like i like to play with how i write as well but i think for this particular book you know i went back to bangladesh to do research because i hadn't been for several years and I'm just like avidly recording all the names of the plants and the trees and the significance of when it's growing. It's like all these little details that are, you know, about the physical landscape, but how it affects the way that the people live. You know, if there's right. only watermelon in season in March, yeah. you know, that, that affects what grows in the fields. Right. That affects like, you know, what people are consuming. Yeah. Um, but for me in the book, that became a moment where that seeing that and knowing that the liberation war started in march Mm. i was able to pull this like detail of watermelon being cracked open to provide like some sort of sustenance for women who are being raped in a house Uh, during the war yeah so these are like things where i'm like making connections and i think all writers do this you find a thing with 
you know, a feeling of serendipity laced into that moment. And you're like, this totally works in this scene with yeah. this character in this moment in this time. And like, I feel like I'm very much attuned to that with my yeah. work. Um, so it's very much about building this world that's very sensorial and sensual. Yeah. Um, because that is the way that I interact with the with world, the world yeah. but also just cause like, that's how a lot of people of color interact with the world. And it's also, I think it's also, <laughs> you, so you talk about, yeah. you know, fiction as a way of reimagining things. Yeah. I, I think it's also a sort of way that you would want people uh, to interact, absolutely. to experience the world. And I'm thinking about, and I just had it, but no, yeah, Kobe Bryant, who like, he had this <laughs> quote about like how offenses are like. Everyone runs the same offense virtually, mm -hmm. but it's execution that changes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what the offense looks like. And I think with writers, I think at the basis, all writers are sort of, it's like in their own ways assessing the same questions, but it's the answer they bring to it that makes it. This is like a Toni Morrison piece. This is a Baldwin piece. This mm -hmm. is, you know, this is, you know, a Roy piece. This is how this particular writer answers the same question that's been, that's what's so dope about getting writing, giving writing assignments out, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you want to, I'm going to give you one assignment and you get 12 pieces back. Absolutely. As opposed to like, I don't want one piece. I don't want one piece from 12 people. I want 12 pieces from 12. Yeah. That writers. are just reflecting individuality yeah. and their own unique, like imprint yeah. on that assignment that you're giving them. Yeah. So what was it like for you? Was this, so the MFA program was where you sort of, fortified the novel i did to an extent okay um but i had to unwrite and unravel a lot of that i mean i was the only person of color in my year God damn. at brooklyn college and there were i think there was another woman but she was part-time and then there was a few people who were black writers that i'm still friends with who were the year ahead of me right which you know we took classes together thank god i'm so happy that we at least had each other yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know Sat i together. yeah i did have a kind of a a moment of you know i'm definitely publishing a book that like i was like i'm this is why i'm here and i wasn't trying to be um gross about that but i was like that's our objective no like are we not like you i think know, that was the could, to, 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 to admit that was just like how dare how, he's yeah. talking about like business of writing yeah. and I'm like, like we are here 50,000 I don't know what I went to the new school so they yeah, they, so we, they, was, they was charging <laughs> I love the school the, 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 the experience was, was irreplaceable but it's yeah. like so was that fucking dollar sign. Yeah. That tag was... Yeah, it was high. No, that shit is... That's why I was ridiculous. like, it seems really cool, but I... Got you gotta it. cash out on this. Yeah. Yeah. So, I just always had that kind of objective on a very, like, you know, my family has given everything for me to have the life I have. Right. I'm gonna do my life the way that not only they want, but the way I want. Right. So, that was always in my mind. But also, when you don't have people reading your work... Like, I had great readers, but I also felt like I was missing a reader that reflected me. You know, like, they were readers. Like the person you were intending to write for. Yeah, you know. And like, I, no, that matters, yeah. And I think it's, like, it, it's one of those things where I think about other friends of mine who are women of color who are writers, and I'm, I just try to imagine, you know, them being read by only white people. And I'm like, well, that wouldn't be great if they don't have black readers too because they're a black writer or they're a South Asian writer and they don't yeah. have South Asian readers. So I was really missing that piece. And I think I got a little lost at the end of my MFA program, to be honest, with the book. And I had Should to I like... Off, yeah. yeah, it knocked me off my vision a little bit because I was trying to make it be like witty and clever and minimal, you know, all this stuff. It's not me. Not that I can't be witty and clever and minimal, but it's no, just... but it's like, who are you doing that for? Exactly. So, you know, being 25, 26, 27, you're no, very I'm impressionable. Not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not... Yeah, 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 yeah. So I had to, like, unravel a lot of the book. Un, like, just erase and throw away things. And, you know, at that point, the book was set in Queens. I'm not even much of a fan of Queens, but I felt it was more authentic to be Queens and South Asian because yeah. I have family there. And I was like, you know what? I've been living on this block for years in... All my neighbors are people that I speak with, and I think it'd be amazing to show a Bangladeshi family living in Brooklyn, honestly. Right. You know, so I think that that totally changed everything, and right. then the book kind of opened itself yeah. to me, because I made this decision to not force myself into, like, the Jackson Heights narrative or something, because yeah. I was like, that's more... That's more, yeah. They see. That's more what they expect, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember, and I'm, I, I went to the MFA program for nonfiction, and... 
I was having, I was in workshop, people telling me the character, like, this person isn't believable. I'm like, this is a person who actually exists. I'm not <laughs> writing fiction. What? But it's, it's, a, it's a thing of, like, that question of who you're writing for. And then, we, you know, you, the real question of markets of, like, well, who's going to believe, you know, and by believe, it's, it's, it's really who's going to buy this book. Mm-hmm. about this type of experience and I, I know you had said that you know a South of Asian an Asian American person and like you said you was in Cali I think mm-hmm. had interrogated you like well what's so different about your story and it was like well like it's not like why is that a response why do I have to be different why can I add another nuance yeah to ever changing ever you know evolving landscape but I wonder if it's like you know again as an Asian person asking that question and not by Asian do you mean like Chinese, Japanese. I'm not sure. I think maybe Who's... Southeast Asian, like Filipino or okay, Vietnamese. Okay, okay. I'm, but I'm not sure. Because you know, Asian is that's that's <laughs> very that. I was just like, all right, who are we talking? <laughs> but about? I, at the same time, I still identify as Asian, so I'm like, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, are we talking about brown Asians? Mm-hmm. Are we talking about? Well, she's you know? brown, but not my type of brown, I guess. Okay. But um, I think that there is a thing like you know, if this was written, God of Small Things was written, why do I need to write this? Or why does there need to be all you know? Why are oh, we yeah. writing the same thing over and over? And I'm just like, that's kind of the dumbest question anyone could ever yeah, ask. Because yeah, yeah. it's like, there are, first of all, not very many stories about Bangladeshis in the South Asian literature canon of the U.S. So that's one thing. It's right. like, this is a whole other country. Yeah. It's not just like, you know, the same experience. Right. Uh, but also, why should we not write the things that move us? if it can add another layer to the human experience. Right. I mean, everything is like a, a small sliver of consciousness that allows us to illuminate one small part of this experience right. as human beings. Uh, that's what I... And I'm, no, and I definitely agree. And I think I fell for that stupid shit of like um, fighting for like a corner of a table not knowing it was a whole fucking table. Yeah. Like you're fighting for like, oh, we're going to fight over like this much left. And it's yeah. like, um, can we get more bottles? Like, yeah. so it's like as a black writer, it's like, I'm about to be the next Baldwin. And then so it's like, all right, like there's 80,000 black kids who also want to be the next Baldwin. But it's like, okay, if you're really reading Baldwin, or when I began to really read Baldwin, or just other writers who I wanted to be like, and I'm going, no, like I can never be them because they were formed by a particular type of crucible that gave their writing a certain Absolutely. thing. And so it was like, yo, I'm not even, I'm not trying to take up space, I'm claiming mine. And also uh, legacy and the meaning of someone's work and someone's culture, the only thing that lasts forever is art. And like when you're long gone, <laughs> mm-hmm. what you made will outlive you. Right. Hopefully that is the point. Right. And you don't know what impact you'll have on society. Right. Like, we but just then don't. It's, and it's like, to write with that, and, and all of us do this. It's right, right, right. totally like, oh, my God, the four mothers that we're writing after and the forefathers that we're writing after. Yeah. But much of that legacy that they've built, I mean, some of it, I mean, we're lucky that Toni Morrison's still here to talk and mm-hmm. educate and share her work and wisdom, but... James Baldwin has been gone for a while and his work is still so relevant and still so powerful right. and palpable for people. And yeah. I love that, you know, his work has outlasted his physical earthly body. And yeah. that's a, such a powerful thing. I think that's what makes writing such a a craft that kind of we grapple with for our whole lives. Because right. we want to create something that lasts. So read something. Okay, from Bright Lines. Last. All yeah. right, all right. Read, 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 some, read something, read something everlasting. All right, okay. Give us some of these words, some of these bars. Okay. I want to get like, you know, I don't know if you re- if you watch like Smack Battles, like rap battles. <laughs> I have watched Smack Battles. Yeah, I want to get the thing, you know, where like they they drop a bar and they be like, burr, 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 burr. like, like I want to get that for like readings. Like if I think it's a hot line, it's like, like a like a flamethrower like sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to read something different because I feel like I always read from the beginning and not in Bangladesh. But I'm going to do that. And just, and people could get this book wherever books are sold. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's fine if you get on Amazon. I don't care. Okay. I'm not mad about that. But you can get at Greenlight and all the independent bookstores. All the independent bookstores in Brooklyn yeah. or wherever. I just, mean, just go like to IndieBound to check it out. She <laughs> has enough money. Um, <laughs> she don't need book money, so she don't need your book money, right? She, she got, she got, she got eighty income. So 
This I do just... want to talk about that because I no. do want book money. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. He's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to be like, I don't know. I want to write to play. I don't want to write to no, get I res- pressure. I, res- I respect it. That's, I respect it. Yeah. I'm joking. But I think I just think it's a dope concept that <laughs> like you are like economically viable without your art. Yeah. I need it to be that way. Yeah. This is another art, my perfume. Oh, we gonna get we'll into get that. There. We yeah, gonna yeah. get into that. We'll I, get I, there. I ain't forget. I, I got my, I got um, my the view sort of format. Like, tell us about your perfume line, that we can, you know. But go do your thing. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna read this part, and I don't know if it's giving away stuff, but traffic obeyed lights, lanes, and signs as they stepped off the C train at Clinton, Washington. The air was unusually cold for April. L wasn't the tallest person on the street. No one paid him any mind. They hadn't been gone long, but Charu swore there were more white women with strollers and tattooed brown queers with oversized glasses since they'd last been home. A natural hair salon had opened and would draw the clients who could no longer get a fix at their mother's salon. Mm. As they turned onto Cambridge Place, a brick wall with black spray spray paint read, everything is everything after winter must come, C-U-M, spring. (laughs) <laughs> just making sure <laughs> it was uh you can't get that from just reading <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. they were home dried out vines crawled up the side of 111 cambridge place specks of rust corroded the wrought iron gate flaking brownstone paint reminded l of a butterfinger bar the limestone pots on the stoop held no flowers of course after winter the garden was in shambles every broken twig seemed like an accusation for being away so long it's like no one ever lived here whispered charu Elle's throat swelled. Maintaining the grandeur of this old house had never been effortless, and now it was their responsibility. They wheeled their suitcases into the living room. What is that suitcase doing there, gasped Charu. What is, what's that horrible smell? Had someone broken in? No. Ugh, it's Aman, that bastard. He must be squatting here. Is he going to be living here with us, Charu groaned. I'm going to go back to school. I can't deal with that motherfucker. We'll figure it out. He won't be here much longer. Now let's air this place out. L opened the curtain in the windows. Millions of dust particles floated in the afternoon sunlight. Piles of paper and Anwar's leather-bound diaries covered the sofa. I'm going upstairs, said Charu, sneezing. I can't deal with this. L went to check on the garden. The remaining hibiscus trees had flowered into two colors, half the buds a pale purple, the other half white, open. Roses sprouted out of the demolished flower clock. Flowers grew out of concrete in the city, just as lotuses sprouted out of shit, Anwar would tell her. The cucumber trellis was, crisscross, as a, was a crisscross of rotting beams. Soil and leaves were grayed, thirsty for water and seed. An unkempt morning glory had turned into a vicious weed that took over the garden. Inside of the vault of seeds, permanent winter reigned. Elle flipped through the card catalog of thousands of varieties of heirloom seeds that her uncle had amassed in his lifetime. Rice, wheat, barley, soy, cannabis, 36 varieties of cannabis, carrot, tomato, potato, cilantro, lavender, peony, gardenia, magnolia, myrtle, and pine. Mm. Missing were the poisonous varieties of datura, of course. Maya's recklessness forced Anwar to throw the datura seeds away. El shivered and went back into the house. El went upstairs to check on Charu. Anwar's side of the bed looked moss, the other side was as neat as it had always been. The ceiling door to his studio was open. Without the help of Anwar's chair, El climbed up to his studio, immediately greeted by the smell of herb burning. Besides some dust and cobwebs, Anwar's studio was pretty neat. Books were arranged by color, papers papers collected into piles. There was a Rorschach-like stain on his rug. On his desk, El recognized the brown parchment paper Anwar had been writing on with such concentration. Mm. If you took the paper as a whole, the parchment seemed to be broken into a map. It was divided into two sections by a thin black line like a river from which civilization sprung. Mm. El pocketed the parchment and remembered the task at hand. Hey, Charu, I'm back here. She spoke from behind a white curtain that quartered the studio kitchen from the rest of the place. El peeled it back, discovering an annexed wallpaper in silver miler. Charu was sitting there crying and smoking a joint. This shit is so good. I fucking love dad. Hmm. The will thing pisses me off, though. Leave it to Baba to cut Aman, a piece of the action, out of the guilt. But at least we have a stash of weed to last us the rest of our lives. She started giggling. Have some. El took a puff. They never smoked together before. At their feet, a border of 19 pint-sized mason jars, each with nuggets of pungent dark green bud laced with purple, lined the floor. So this was Anwar's clandestine adventure. Surrounding them were dozens of small cardboard boxes filled with enough cannabis seed to start a proper harvest. The recipient address read, Mr. Aman Salim. Charu, look, said El. 
Our uncle's name is all over these boxes. Lying on the floor next to them, a folder with credit card bills, all in their uncle's name. They went outside to the veranda to watch the sunset and get high. You know I see them every day, said Charu, inhaling the joint. She passed it back to El. I do too. They stayed on the veranda all evening, smoking their father's stash and searching for their parents suspended somewhere in the unreadable city sky. I like that. <laughs> I like that. And I think that's the greatest transition because you talk about the hibiscus and, and this <laughs> and that and all the all the herbs and the and the, and the herb, the herb, <laughs> the herb. Of course, your stone stoner voice. The herb. Um, but this is a great transition to talk about how I flower. Yes. So, okay. So, I want to so, spray though. Are you into scents? Yes. Spray me. All right. Uh, so on your skin, on a paper. Yeah. yeah like, what? how do you do it? What do you? Let's, let's do it on your wrist. Let's just do it the way if lesson. you were like one of the. Yeah. Custom. So this one's called mm. Sandalo. Okay. Um, and if you like it, you can have it. It's unisex. And this one is, yeah, he likes it. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a gift. Thank um, you. Now we're going to smell the same. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's <laughs> we're good. very connected. Like, yeah, I got my, um, got my tawny. Tawny. Yeah. Okay, boom. I'm just very, yeah, yeah. I see the W and I, I want to pronounce it, but I got my tawny on. silent W. I got you. But yeah, um, I'm, yeah, I got my... So Sandalo, so I, one of my like spiritual homes in my, you know, travels is Hawaii, which Word. is, have you ever been to Hawaii? Hell no, I can't afford them flights. One day, start a piggy bank on that one. It's okay. worth it. It's paradise. And it's sad that it became part of America and it's sad that it's like the white man like went and like took this beautiful land from native Hawaiians. Yeah. It's a very, very sad place in that way. But it's also... A place where the earth is being born constantly through volcanic activity in the ocean and such a beautiful sentence <laughs> but it's so true <laughs> i like i get full of beautiful sentences there i mean everything that i've it's it's this place that i you know i got laid off from a job and i had no money to really do much of anything except you know buy this one ticket and stay with a friend and i just did it and i was like you know what, I got to work on my book and I'm really depressed because depression is a thing I think a lot of writers face, but I think when yeah. you're feeling like economically strapped and also feeling unwanted and rejected, oh, I just, just, it just gets you, you know, because I was like, no one thinks I'm smart and can do a job, whatever. So I went there and immediately all of these kind of uh, floral you know, inspirations would pop out of just the ground, the plumeria trees, the TRA flowers. I mean, it was just like the flower would fall into your lap, you know, like, cause it's just like a flower shedding, you know, itself from the tree. It's just yeah, falling into yeah, it. Yeah. And I just started to kind of get really like attuned to how these particular parts of the Hawaiian landscape were kind of embedding themselves in me where I was like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I want to recreate this like waxy petal flower smell in yeah. some sort of and I had already been working on perfumes, but it was very much like art installation type of thing. So for okay. Bushwick Open Studios, I like made four perfumes and like let people scent, smell them and yeah. kind of write down like their feelings from smelling it. It wasn't really a business at that point. And then going to Hawaii, this perfume that I sprayed on you, it's really about how do I take a material like Royal Hawaiian Sandalwood. Mm -hmm. And sandalwood in India, my store sandalwood is endangered species from perfumery pretty much oh damn yeah like it's been so used in perfumery because sandalwood is yes they've been killing the trees so now there are new sources of sandalwood in hawaii in new caledonia in australia mm. they're all new strains of, of i'm gonna this. put this back on the on the table just so people can know what it looks like <laughs> yes but this is mine but we keep talking keep original talking. design by me hey. um so it's one of those things where i wanted to create this hawaiian sandalwood perfume not an indian one because it doesn't smell like an indian incense -y sandalwood it's right. a very fresh sandalwood right. but then also like if we built this bonfire of driftwood and we also added this sort of like element of sweet florals kind of wafting off the ocean like yeah. how to kind of create that whole vibe. i smell like i'm wafting off the ocean yes, in a good way exactly. in the best way Venus out of the water yeah. so that was kind of like you know I, these little touch points of inspiration that kind of become the you know story or whatever yeah. you want to call it i mean it's it is that it's a composition right and it's a collection of different notes that create some sort of synchronicity yeah sort i, I of saw harmony. that on the website that you had really brought you had brought a parallel between the way you build sense 
and the way you write. Yeah, and the way and I there's write. A, there's a parallel. There's, a, there's, a, totally. there's a essential parallel. So, um, and the materials too. So, like, I brought this new thing that I'm working on, just so you can kind of try that. Um, so I'll just put it right here. Damn. So this one is okay. very different. It's more feminine, obviously, but the story in this one is how to create a watery floral that feels very much like Bangladesh. Okay. And this has notes of lotus and hyacinth. Mm. And basically hyacinth is this beautiful purple flower that grows on top of ponds and lakes, but it's also killing the life underneath it because no sunshine can get through. Goddamn. Yeah. So I'm like, I want to create this like choking, like floral scent. So this is kind of like sandalwood is the base of it, but there is this other layer of these white Now how does, how do you even make a, a scent? Well, I have hundreds of oils that I've collected. Okay. And you just... You start to, yeah, you start to kind of just... I think it starts with concept, like any art. It starts right. with the concept, and then you start to actually play a little bit. So yeah. this is like a new... I'm playing. This is like me playing. And okay. then this will take well, you know, six they say months to percolate. Play is the highest form of research. Exactly. That's, that's, that's how you got to keep it. Exactly. So this all started not even from Bright Lines, and I think that that's something that you know is a misconception with... Everything because I had been basically working in nonprofit up until my book was sold, and then after that, I was kind of Fuck this. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> I'm done with you, <laughs> high school students. No, I love high school students. I'm still friends with those students, yeah. and they're adults now. Uh, and they've seen me at events where they're like, "Oh my god, like I could do whatever I want to," you know? Because yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, they're yeah. just like, "I knew you as like the teacher that took us on field trips, and yeah, now you're like yeah. doing your own thing." Yeah, like, yeah. It's great. I think that like they need to see that we don't have to be one thing our whole lives, like yeah. our families and parents and grandparents did. So to me, it's like I started working on my next book, which I'm still working on and probably will be working on for a while. And that character is a perfumer. So I was already thinking about this new novel and kind of method writing yeah. by experiencing this character. All right. You like, the, you like the Christian Bale of, of writing, <laughs> the method actor, meth, method writer. And then I'm just <laughs> talking in a high voice all the time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he has yeah. this like crazy voice. He's just like... Not quite British, not quite American. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what he be did, what he be doing. <laughs> um, before you get out of here, three things. Mm -hmm. First thing is, a lot of books are turned into movies. Option to movies shows. Mm -hmm. The problem is often the representation gets skewed. As a person who wrote this book, who do you see playing the characters? Yes. Oh my god, like I the love main that character. question. Yeah, like who do you see? Not just playing it, but it was a question I had asked. Um, Jesse Shafee who came on here and she talked about her book. Who'd she say? She, who did she say? She said Anne Hathaway. She went to see play oh, cool. um, Hannah and uh, Florence and Ecstasy. But I'm interested <laughs> to see like main character and more importantly the, the director. Who would you want to see direct? Oh my gosh. Okay, so main character. I'm like, I don't know any like trans male South Asian actors. I would want it to be a South... That's the thing. I can't really answer that question for Elle because Elle is a trans character. Mm -hmm. And I would love for someone who is genderqueer or trans to play Elle. So, I think this conversation creates that. Yeah. So let's... let's search. I'm, uh, if let's, you let's, are let's, that... Let's reimagine. Like, human yeah. being that can really step into Elle, I would love to find you to play that. So that's mm. a call for that. Yeah. Um, and then for Anwar... And this is like, he's an Indian dude, not a Bangladeshi dude. But there's this Indian actor. I think his name is Irfan Khan. Okay. Um, I think that's his name. I'll, I'm going to send you a picture of him. Okay. But we'll, he's fly as hell. And I feel like if he just gained 30 pounds and had a pot belly and like a mustache, I think he would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> he's very cute. Yeah. Um, and then also for the the part where there's like the flashbacks to... The war. Um, mm -hmm. I love Riz Ahmed. He's a friend of mine, and okay. he would be great for him as a young, the younger version of okay, Anwar. Um, so and directors, yeah. I love. Um, what's his name? He did Shame and Twelve Years a Slave. What's that director's name? Oh, Steve McQueen. Uh, Steve McQueen. Yeah, I would love him to. There you go. This is you gotta. You know, we gotta get in charge of our narrative. <laughs> Steve, like, nah, you gotta. You, it, I, I, I really feel like once I started to see how many novels were turned into movies, and how like not true, not even just of course you can't be true to everything in the book, but to the spirit of the book. Absolutely. And I feel like you know a lot of times to be able to say this is who I I would imagine liking to play this role. I think that creates a conversation of like 
it even allows people to see the book in a very real way because now mm-hmm. as a real person you go oh i can kind of see what you see so that is what adds to it um the second thing is yo danny i need you to pass me my uh bag brother right there oh uh, we always you you bring gifts we got gifts and it's not just Marduce. Uh, what? so uh what we what I, what we have for all guests coming on the shizzo is this pin that's for you and look, I, look at this incredible box oh yeah and what yeah yeah thank yeah. That's, you that's for you so oh my god okay yeah. this is definitely going on my denim jacket yeah that's 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 the that's the that's the lit pin should i put this on yeah put that on put all that right, on i'm gonna put it on but Give that's that's for you for coming to the show thank you um and then the last thing yeah. is uh well, actually, two more things. The mm-hmm. last thing is, where can people find you on the net, on 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 the social? I'm just high wildflower. I'm high wildflower on everything. Okay. Because I, I need like a little bit of space from my name to just be like Donny Nandini as I'm in my life. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. don't have everything being like at Donny Nandini, at this, at that. Yeah, so yeah, if you yeah. try to find at Donny Nandini on Twitter, it's like some Russian hacked my account. And like, because I did used to have that. So it's all high wildflower for my brand. Mm. And... As you'll see, it's like one of those, um, like Twitter's where I get angry. Instagram's where I act like life is perfect and beautiful. <laughs> Facebook is where I'm complaining all the time. Yeah, yeah, I'm very yeah. different. You got, like, different. you got different brands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, got di- I got different energies. No, you got to play your lanes differently. Yeah, but I feel like for, oh, this is such a beautiful box. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's yeah, all good. This was a f- really, yeah. Uh, I'm glad you're also doing this because. Thank you. Seeing writers in their multifaceted things. Because we're the people that like can disappear into our work. Right. And it's nice to get a sense of what everyone's up to. Yeah. Everyone's doing different shit. That's that's what this is for. <laughs> so we know where to follow. You have any events coming up? Any? I know you're going to be at Afropunk do. next Saturday. I'm going to be at Afropunk if you want to buy perfume or lipstick yeah. or any of my many things. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be... And you're be, wearing your lipstick? This is yours? Mm-hmm. Okay. Vanda, which is an orchid that grows at the bottom of the forest. Hey. And I have an event coming up. At Joe's Pub on September 13th. Okay. And You're going to be at the Brooklyn Book Festival? I think it's the same time. I don't know what's tied in with that. Okay. I don't think I'm doing like a Brooklyn Book, Book Festival, Festival event, event panel. Like a, a Brooklyn Book Festival adjacent event. Yeah. And Joe's Pub is fabulous. So I'm yeah. like totally into that. And then I think I'm doing an event um, 10-3, October 3rd at The Strand. Like, okay. I'll, I'll be more. Yeah, yeah. Well, well you know, we, we, you know, we, we, we I'm got, not that great at being my own publicist. We, we, well, we, that's why we got this show, and that's why we got the Lit Platform, where you can follow us at Lit Platform. Yes. Follow, uh, you know, your boy at at your Don. Um, and before we get out of here, literary swag. Your favorite three writers. Your favorite three clothing designers. Okay. So my favorite three writers, I'd have to say, are Toni Morrison. Okay. Um, I. Love Salman Rushdie. Okay. And I also am really just into Alexander Kleeman. She's okay. a new writer that I'm into. Yeah, I've, I've seen she's, her name pop up in a lot of yeah, things. And in the swag. Great. And the swag. I love YSL. Mm. Vintage YSL, because that's what I can afford. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be real about it. Vintage is <laughs> fabulous, but also affordable for me. Yeah. Um, and then I'm really into this brand called La Causa that does like moo-moos and caftans and okay, stuff. They're right. tie-dyed. I'm sorry. No, it's all good. I'm sorry. I know that we're not. And then I, <laughs> I'm like, I know you're grossed out by that. Um, and I'm not. Then, it's, 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 a, it's a particular <laughs> swag. I mean, I want to I want to get us a wrong going. I want to get us a wrong life going in my older, old, older years. If you were in Bangladesh, you would be living that. See, that's what I feel like. I yeah. feel like I could be the, the, the next, you know, young Andre 3000, but I digress. <laughs> and my last... <laughs> Designer. Um, I love Tom Ford accessories and lipsticks and sunglasses. So Tom Ford. Okay. For sure. Well, this is... I like my Euro... (laughs) Euro... High-low. High-low. Euro-South Asian connection. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been another episode of Lit. Um, Make sure you go and grab this book, uh, Bright Lines. It's it's wherever books are sold. Uh, it's dropping literally not only in this show but it's, it's everywhere um, make sure you check Tawny out at uh, Afropunk make sure you pull up to the events uh, make sure you follow us make sure you watching make sure you listening this has been another episode Liddy Fontaine signing out it's lit <laughs>